Thomas J. Ord. You are a theologian. You're a philosopher. You're an ordained minister. You're a scholar. You've offered over or around 30 books. And Tom, you might soon be adding the title heretic to your name. So you recently put out a video on YouTube uh, letting folks know that you are facing a pending trial with the denomination, the Church of the Nazarene, because you, uh, as an ordained minister, credentialed uh, person in the denomination, uh, personally affirmed LGBTQ um, IA people. So, Tom, tell us about this. Tom, this is uh, this isn't 1824. It's not 1624. It's not 13. 24. Tom, do heresy trials still exist? Yeah, apparently so. I'm, I have two charges against me. One is teaching doctrines contrary to the Church of the Nazarene, and the second is conduct unbecoming a minister because of my efforts to try to get the denomination to become fully affirming of queer people. And, um, yeah. The first charge is for your own convictions, your own beliefs, your own perspective of inclusion. But the second charge is because you are proselytizing that view or you are trying to influence the denomination in that view? Yeah. Going on podcasts like yours and talking about the need for change is considered conduct unbecoming uh, a minister, apparently. I don't think it is, but uh, some people want me to keep my mouth shut, and I don't feel like I should. So, here we are. I think in your your um, your announcement video, you had mentioned that um, the denomination served you these two charges, so you know specifically what you're being charged for. You don't know when you're going to be having the trial, but you know what you're. Um, being charged with, uh, Tom, t t how does a, how does a heresy tr in 2024, how does a heresy trial go? Do you know, is there a prosecution? Is there a defense? I I explain how this works. Yeah. The details are really fuzzy. I've been trying to get information from the denomination on this. I do know that I have the right to bring a lawyer as long as that person is an, or, or is, is a, uh, member of the Church of the Nazarene. I can't bring my wife and a lawyer. I have to choose, <laughs> which I think is pretty funny in a denomination that has long talked about how important that couples are in ministry instead of, you know, emphasizing the one person. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. But, can, she be, can she be sitting in the room and watching this just no. as support? Or you no, either have to pick lawyer. a lawyer <laughs> or, my wife, or yeah. your spouse. I yep. most people usually would not pick the lawyer, but uh, what are you uh, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna bring my wife. I mean, she's kind of on the fence on whether or not she wants to attend, but I think she will at the end. Um, it'll be stressful for her and all. But I'm one of the reasons I'm not picking a lawyer is that I think the conclusion is foregone. I think I'm gonna lose my credentials, and uh, I want to make a case theologically rather than rely upon an expert in procedural matters, which a lawyer would be, uh, well, I mean, to the extent they understand the denomination's rules and things. So I want the focus to shift away from, are we following the proper procedures? Is this correct? That kind of case has already been run through the system by uh, another Nazarene who wrote an essay for my book. Uh, why the Church of the Nazarene should be fully LGBTQ plus affirming. And for his essay, he was brought up on charges. He was convicted. He appealed. He went through the system, made all the legal kinds of arguments. Uh, so that's kind of been done, and that's not really my interest anyway. What I'm most interested in are the theological arguments. I'm a theologian, <laughs> so I want to make the argument that uh, loving people fully affirm queer people. 
And um, so in some ways, not bringing a lawyer will help me to uh, to have more time to make that kind of case. Yeah, and in a moment, I want to get to the heart of this uh, because really the heart of it is love and inclusion and acceptance of all people and God's people. I'll get to that in a moment, but I do want to ask you a couple procedural things just to to understand this. So when the trial finally happens and you're in this room, is is that what happens? These two charges are made against you and then they bring in evidence that you have committed uh, these two uh, things you're being charged with? Is that... Uh, when the... I was given the charges in the summer of 2023, I was also given the evidence they offered for why I'm guilty. So I have the evidence from their side. I have then written a long response to that, including my evidence. I'll submit that before the trial. And then I presume at the trial we'll have questions about my responses, and I'll have time to you know talk about various things. But again, it's pretty much in the dark uh, at this point of how the trial uh, will play out. And so, if these two charges are, I guess one is personal, one is congregational. Uh, the first charge is that Thomas J. Ord one of our credentialed and ordained ministers holds gay inclusion personally. Uh, So they'll, they'll bring evidence to show that you hold that personally. Then the second charge is a more congregational denominational charge that you are now using your personal beliefs on this to influence the denomination against what they believe. And then I suppose they'll bring evidence to that. So, Tom, then what is your defense? Your your defense is only, what what is your defense? It's your personal beliefs and then your, your theological hermeneutic as to why you affirm this. Is, is, is that right? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to say when I get up there. I'm going to plead not guilty to two charges and guilty to a third charge. I'm going to plead not guilty to conduct unbecoming a minister because uh, what I've been doing to try to get the denomination to change doesn't, uh, isn't against what our manual says. It's not immoral. It's not anything like that. I'm going to plead not guilty to teaching doctrines contrary to the Church of Nazarene. And this is a more technical kind of issue because our statement on human sexuality is not in the part of the manual pertaining to doctrine. So I'm making a procedural kind of a technical kind of move there that I am against what the denomination says about human sexuality, but it's not a doctrinal position. And then the third thing that I'm going to plead guilty to is one I'm making up and putting on the table. I'm going to plead guilty to loving queer people and wanting to see the denomination do the same. So, yeah, yeah. Tom, why, um, I mean, here's the deal. You, you have been part of this denomination for decades. You obviously are a learned, smart, common sense person. You, you have known what the sexual ethic of the Church of the Nazarene has been and assumes it's going to continue. So my point is, when you began to differ from that, uh, with your own scholastic theological reputation, you could have just quietly left and continued on in your career, your ministry, your scholarship. But you chose to stay and to, in a sense, fight this. Why uh, you and I both have gay, bi, trans friends. These are, uh, even though you and I as straight people, we are allied to these people we love and believe God loves. So why does this matter? Why why didn't you just walk out the door? 
why are you choosing to fight this? Why, why does it matter, especially for our LGBTQ friends? Yeah, there's actually quite a few reasons for why I stayed and why I am going through this process, uh, facing the trial and, and all. Um, one is, of course, that I think it's the right thing to do to stand for my queer friends, but you know, I could do that if I left the denomination. Um, I have discovered over the last several decades that there are actually a lot of Nazarenes who think like I do. I'm not the lone person out there who thinks the denomination is wrong on this issue. There are many, many, many people in the denomination. And in fact, if you were to uh, ask the scholars, the biblical, philosophical, theological scholars of the denomination where they stand, the majority would be on my side. So then I think to myself, okay, by the way, how do you, how do you know that? Because I, I believe you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meaning because the, yeah. 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 The, we're leaving games with people. you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're a small group, but right. maybe 50 total scholars in the United States. So. You know, and I right. know I've been around yeah. long enough. And most of them, once they retire from their positions, they'll come out publicly in support. So, so that's one reason. Another is that you know I used to not be an affirming person. I used to think that uh, queer sexuality, queer sexual behavior, was sinful. And then I did some real study on the matter biblically. I looked at science, psychological literature, theology, etc., and I changed my mind. Um, And so I'm optimistic that at least a certain percentage of people in the denomination, if they're given the arguments, will, you know, have a change of mind. Not everybody. I don't think everyone will, but I think there's some education that needs to go on. And my having a public witness to this can be helpful in that educational process. And then a a third reason I'll just put on the table, um, suppose I just walked away quietly and the Church of the Nazarene continued on its course. The kind of stories I know of current Nazarenes who are queer, who went through such pain and heartache and were ostracized, that's likely to continue on after I leave. And so I think about future queer kids in the Church of the Nazarene. They need to come into a place that can be accepting of them. And even though I doubt my stand is going to overturn the denomination overnight, perhaps I can do my part in making a more hospitable and loving place for queer kids in the future. And then they're in. Yeah, and that's, I mean, you're really driving at the heart of the issue and um, the transition of your own heart and then, how this ultimately affects people day to day. First about you, Tom, uh, and you and I have spoken about this before. And I think when I was asking you about this before, the topic came to love. And so, um, so we don't get caught in the weeds about trials and defenses and prosecutions and hermeneutics and theological interpretations. When you finally said, okay, this was my view, and now I need to change it, um, how was love, where was love in that and, and part of that? Yeah, I think I had, by the time I changed my view, come to believe that I needed to have a theology that was oriented around the ways of love. And, you know, that's not an uncommon approach in the Wesleyan tradition that I'm a part of. John Wesley had that kind of theology of love. And so I was kind of there as a a framework that love should be in the center. And I, like a lot of people I know who grew up in evangelical congregations, began to explore the queer issues, in those days we called them the homosexuality issues, um, I began to explore with the Bible. I looked at those few passages that are in Scripture that seem to, at least many people, interpret as being against queer people. And then I read the scholarship on both sides of the issues. I looked beyond those passages to others. And I began to think um, the Bible isn't 
a book with a crystal clear message on every topic. Uh, it, but there do seem to be certain themes that rise to prominence. And I think the themes of love are the most important. And so I then developed what we in the academy would call a hermeneutic of love. I tried to come to scripture assuming that love was somehow key to what it means to understand God and life. And with that hermeneutic, then I had a way of uh, addressing the passages that are often interpreted as uh, against queer affirmation, uh, but also it opened my eyes to passages that seemed to be supportive. And love became not only the center of my hermeneutic, but also um, it's important to me to explain what I mean by love. For, for, for me, love is an intentional action and relational response to God and others that aims for flourishing or well-being. And it seemed very clear to me, not only from the science, but also from the friendships I had with queer people, that queer sexual relationships could be healthy and they could promote well-being, they could promote flourishing. For me, that's kind of the bottom line here. Um, the questions I want to ask are, does this activity, these ideas, do they promote well-being? And, and I know that's not always easy to, to tease out, but I think I have the majority of science and the majority of the witness of queer people that there are sexual or healthy sexual behaviors, expressions, identities, orientations, etc. Absolutely. And I'm intrigued by this uh, theological concept of a hermeneutic of love. And for anybody listening, uh, the word hermeneutic or hermeneutical just means interpretation. Yeah. Um, so, Tom, some scholars, some ministers like me, they have a, a hermeneutic or a theology of holiness or a uh, theology of righteousness you know, um, maybe a theology of biblis, a more biblicistic theology. Yeah, how, uh, man, I, I think this hermeneutic of love is everything. And I actually think it's what spiritual people, and specifically people who want to hold on to their Christian spirituality, it's not just the academy or the theologians and the ministers who are wrestling with this theology of love. It's happening in the pews and yes. in the seats. I think more and more people are going, can Christian spirituality become beautiful again where it is a hermeneutic, where it is a theology of love? Yeah, yeah. And I think most people, most people are not academics like me, uh, but they've come across uh, queer people who are great people and, and live uh, positive ways. And they think, okay, well, I know Jane and I know Terry and I know they're good people. How can they be condemned by loving God? Why does the church not include them fully? This makes no sense to me. So, um, yeah. You can come to the position I'm at from a variety of places or ways. And I think it's always, I think it always should be about people. I think, you know, when we look at our tradition and we look at the engagement, the traditional engagement of Jesus was with people. Right. Um, you know, he didn't uh, just philosophize, just... Uh, teach deep theology. He didn't, uh, Jesus, you know, our tradition honors uh, Jesus as someone who engaged with people in loving and in compassionate ways. Yep. And yes, um, these LGBTQIA plus people, they are our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, they are our workmates. They are our aunts, our uncles, our parents, our children. Um, the, they are our friends, our neighbors. It, it's people we love. And to, 
to imagine a Christian spiritual gospel of love where they are not affirmed and um, included is, to me, it's unimaginable, especially in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, that's I, about, go ahead. I was going to say, I think Jesus himself provides a model here in, in, in the ways that you are talking about, in that Jesus seemed to always start with the people and was willing to set aside the rules if he thought the rules undermined the good of the people. You know, the sa- you, people were not made for the Sabbath, he says, as his followers are accused of picking grain on the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath is made for people, which means that people are the highest priority here. And sometimes you have to break out, break the rules or start or create new ways of thinking for the good of the people. I find that my opponents, they typically begin with a particular way of reading the Bible and then a kind of righteousness, legalism. These are the rules. God set the rules. It's clear to us if we just read the Bible, it's right here. And these people are breaking the rules. Therefore, they're out. And um, I just don't think that represents the way of Jesus well. And we've got plenty of examples in history in which that way of thinking, starting with the so-called rules given by God, have led to horrific things, including slavery, including women not being considered equal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And Tom, you had mentioned something uh that I know is even more important to you, which is not just how this affects you. Uh, If the outcome is that you lose this trial and you lose your Church of Nazarene credentials, that's one thing. And I'm not being dismissive uh, of that. But you mentioned, I know something even greater to you, which is if this kind of exclusionary teaching carries on with a spiritual or God weight to it. This just does deep shame and damage uh, to a generation and to people that we care about. And one of the things you do in your public video about this uh, is something of very interest to me because it was it was specifically part of my capstone thesis at Harvard, and that is how an unaffirming, biblicistic, literal interpretation of the Bible, how it actually jeopardizes the life and the lives of gay, bi, trans people, uh, which I find our former evangelical friends never address. They always want to address their view of the theology, but they stay away from the actual harm that the theology is doing and what it is doing to to LGBTQIA mental health, what it is doing, putting them at the risk of suicide if those gay kids' parents are sitting in those churches and then their parents come home and give the same theological judgment and exclusion to these kids, it's putting their lives at risk of suicide because of parental rejection. I mean, this is a real, real issue, is it not? Definitely, definitely. So, Tom, what happens? You know the charges against you, the two charges. Um, You know you're going to trial at some point. So what happens next? Well, at this very moment, I'm trying to get the denomination to follow their own manual and give my case what's called a regional theological committee review but the denomination doesn't want to do that. They want to move this thing through as quickly as possible, and um, they don't want to follow their own rules, and that's making me upset, but, you know, they have the power, so I don't have a lot to do it, a lot to say about that except to go publicly and say this isn't right. Um, you know, they're asking for a trial in July, and um, that's probably what it will end up being. Um 
I expect to probably lose that trial, not because I think I have bad arguments, but because I think <laughs> the verdict's already in. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Um, I don't know where things are going, but I feel like I need to be faithful to where I think God is calling me to love in this moment. And this, I feel pretty confident that I'm doing the right thing. Um, and I guess we'll just see where it all goes. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what, what effect, like how public is this within the church of the Nazarene amongst the Nazarene colleges, seminaries, the, the, the pulpits around the country, the Nazarene churches. Um, and I, I think you're right. You're, you're going to lose, um, but you losing, what do you think it's going to have any uh, effect within the I denomination? Yeah, yeah, I think it will. I don't know how I can measure this accurately, but my hunch is that I'm the most well known theologian in the denomination and one of the w most well known people outside of our general superintendents because I have a fairly significant public profile. Um, you know, I expect if I lose, other people will walk away voluntarily like they've been doing for decades over this issue, but probably that will increase some. Uh, but I don't think this issue is going to go away from the denomination after I go away. I, I, I fully expect decades from now that the denomination will change its views. And I say that in large part just because of the demographics. If you, if you look at young Nazarenes and what they think about this, it's more likely they think like I do than the current state of affairs. So this is, i just going to conclude by saying, this is just kind of the beginning of what's going to be a long process of change. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to ask you about. You know, we just recently saw the UMC uh, change uh, its theological per, uh, position on affirmation. But do you think the Church of the Nazarene is decades away? Uh, are they... Yeah, hard to know. I mean, um, you know, like the UMC, the Nazarenes have a geographical divide. Nazarenes in Africa and South America tend to be more conservative on this issue. Nazarenes in the U.S. and Europe are more progressive. Um, in the UMC, they had a split, an official split, and that helped to, you know, let the more conservative folks go a different way. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened to the Nazarenes, but I, I don't I don't know. Uh, I'm yeah. not, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that, but people come to me and many, 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 many people do and say, Tom, you're trying to divide the church in Nazarene. You're trying to bring about a split. I like to say to them, hey, we've been splitting for decades as young people quietly walk away out the back door. Um, so we've already got problems with the split. We're just pretending like it's not happening. Yeah. You had mentioned in your video that um, that the denomination, now that they served you these charges officially, they did not want you to comment on them publicly, um, which yeah. doesn't necessarily seem fair at all. Uh, and, and you had even mentioned a, a strong uh, sense that you were they were trying to silence you uh, by threatening more charges against you. So uh, what is that? How are they trying to silence you? Uh, why do they not want you to speak on it? One, two, how are they trying to silence you? And three, what are the additional charges against you if you do speak publicly about it? Yeah, they don't want me to speak because they want to not this not to become a public debate. They want it to just be taken care of quietly. Yeah, and they want to control the narrative, obviously. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, they sent me a note no, about 10 days ago or so saying that the disciplinary board had taken a vote 
and voted that no one can talk about this on social media. No one can talk about this, that, and the other. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I am ignoring that. I send them a note back saying I would ignore it, so they know exactly that you know I'm not going to follow their rules. Yeah. Um, what will happen? You know, they've threatened to give me another, um, another charge of conduct unbecoming, which I've already got. So maybe it'll just become additional evidence to that charge. I don't know. I'm not worried about that. Um, you know, one of the freedoms I have is that I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose this case. So I'm not trying to tiptoe around things. I'm just going straight to the heart and saying what I think and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, we wish you the best uh, on this. And um, again, I know your heart on this is even beyond uh, how you experience this. It's really the greater reason and the greater cause, and that's for the the freedom, the affirmation, the liberation of our gay, bi, and trans plus friends. Uh, we know, as the studies show, uh, 50% of all LGBTQ people want a religious life. They want a spiritual life, and um, but they are being excluded from communities uh, that talk about Christ's love, and then yet they can't participate in it. And this is causing deep shame. It's causing suicide, which I'll speak for me. Uh, I'm not pretending to speak for you. Uh, I think the evangelical church is overwhelmingly complicit uh, to that, and they do not even address uh, that their theology is actually wounding, hurting, and actually killing uh, people. And uh, I know you facing this trial, those are the bigger thoughts uh, you have. So, uh, Tom, I wish you well, and um, I guess we look forward to hearing, but yeah. um, I know, I know, you know, your stature as a theologian and your influence in the the evolving love of God will continue. Um, and um, I hope this brings love and grace and care to our LGBTQ friends. So yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for the conversation, Dave. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>